Okay, so I think we've started to get a good number of participants on now. We're expecting a few more, but I'll just start by welcoming everyone to this joint event. So this is between Engineering Together, the Women's Engineering Society and the Tees and Tyneside Cluster um, and the Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, so welcome to this Mentioning the Unmentionables event. This week we are focusing on the parenthood penalty um, and we are uh, have a range of speakers for you today. Um, so we will we will begin once I finish this um, and we do really appreciate you giving up your time so we will make sure that we finish on or before one o'clock. Um, the session is going to begin with like a personal story from each of our speakers. Um, so Rachel is going to do the first story and then she will chair the stories. Um, there'll be loads of time for questions so that's just going to give you a taste and an introduction to the topic and then there'll be lots of time for questions and um, we're going to run the Q&A through the chat so if you have a question please post it in the chat um, and then Andrea is going to collect all those questions together and pose them back to the panel so there's no need to kind of unmute yourself and ask your question just type it into the chat at any point. Um, the session is being recorded. Hopefully you've all just seen that that's happened. If you don't want to be recorded yourself, just please put your camera off um, and then that'll be available to watch again afterwards and share with colleagues. Um, so, yeah, I think just thank you again and I really hope you enjoyed this event. So I'll pass you over to Rachel Leyland now. Thanks, Beth. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Rachel Leyland, Senior HR Business Partner and Reward Lead at Sir Robert McAlpine, um, which for those of you that don't know is a family owned UK construction company. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to have a, an open discussion about the challenges of parenthood in the context of work. Um, before I share my story and a bit about me, um, I thought it was Good to just highlight some statistics to sort of bring to life why this topic is really important. Um, so the 2019 Working Families Report reported that 75% of mothers and 95% of fathers with dependent children are in work. Single parents make up nearly a quarter of families with dependent children. Um, almost three in 10 mothers with a child aged 14 and under said they'd reduce their working hours because of childcare. Um, in a survey of more than 1,000 women run by um, MMB magazine, it was reported that less than a fifth felt happy and confident about returning to work after maternity leave. Um, and even more shockingly, more than a third felt so unsupported that they considered handing in their notice. Um, in a report just last year, the number of fathers taking paternity leave has plummeted to a 10 year low um, with only about a quarter of eligible fathers taking time off work. Um, and despite the shared parental leave um, being introduced in 2015 um, in an attempt to transform gender equality and to make life easier for families, take up still remains really low. Um, so there's loads to talk about, um, lots of different aspects to parenthood. We'll all have a different experience here today, I'm sure, um, but it's important that we have this open discussion. Um, so me personally, I'm a parent to two boys aged seven and four. So my life is lots of fun, <laughs> but very busy. Both me and my husband have busy, demanding jobs, uh, conflicting schedules. Um, so it's challenging, but we recognise we're really lucky in lots of ways. Um, just a bit about my journey to becoming a parent. Um, it actually started well before uh, we became parents because it took us quite a few years to get there, navigating things like fertility treatment, um, all of which was really difficult to juggle alongside work. Um, and I think that's an aspect of parenthood which is often not spoken about. Um, it's quite often under the radar because of the really personal nature of it. It's a private matter, um, but that can lead to people struggling in silence um, whilst trying to navigate all of those things, appointments, et cetera, often during work time and at short notice. Um, and I think that can lead to um, sometimes a really stressful situation. Um, in fact, I saw there was an article published just today um, with regards to a new IVF bill, which is coming out. Um, and that quoted that 15% of couples experience infertility problems. So it'd be great to have more of a discussion about this topic in the context of work. Um, I had two very different experiences of maternity leave um, with my boys, both of which were before I joined SRM. 
it was with a previous employer. Um, the first I was supported by a brilliant manager. Um, I felt supported, included, welcome back to work. The second wasn't so positive um, and that was all down to leadership, all down to openness, transparency um, and feeling supported. So it, it just goes to show that the role of the line manager and the culture of the organisation can have a massive impact on somebody's experience. Um, but since then, I've moved on to Sir Robert McAlpine and, and I've actually had the opportunity to help shape our family policies, which has been a brilliant experience. Um, and that's very much around inclusivity, um, about treating everybody the same, irrespective of gender, irrespective of how your family is grown, whether that's birth, adoption, surrogacy, um, because we have to appreciate that people go through such differing experiences. Um, and for me, one of the things that's really important to me in my role is to make sure that we really understand what's going on in people's lives um, and that we have an open and honest dialogue about that so that we can allow people to do their best um, in their own personal circumstances. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today to have this conversation um, and I'm joined by some brilliant people who are also going to share their stories. Um, so on the panel with me today there's uh, Joanne Roberts who's transport Strategy and Road Safety Manager at Stockton on Teesborough Council, Christopher Cr Crabtree, Director of Education at Durham University, and Dervila Mitchell, CBE Deputy Chair at Arab Group. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining, um, and I'm really pleased to firstly hand over to Joanne. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So as Rachel kindly introduced me there, I'm Joanne Roberts, and I live and work in Stockton on Tees. Um, I do live in the borough as well. I have two sons and they're aged 18 and 16 and I found myself a single parent in 2010 when the boys were aged six and four and anecdotally I've got a story about when I was pregnant second time as well so when I told my line manager that um, I was pregnant I al already had a son and he said to me well let's hope it's a girl this time so you don't take any more time off um, so you know again it's just you know being supported by your line manager is always, uh, is always helpful. So in 2010, when I found myself a single parent, I, I was working part time. I was doing a role it was about 18 hours a week. Um, and I'd, I'd done that since returning from my first period of maternity leave in, in 2004. I did get promoted in 2007 when my second son was a year old. And I increased my hours at that time to 30. But that was because the role that I, I did take on was a full time role where I tried to manage it within part time hours. So I did three days in the office. And then I'd, I'd, I'd sort of followed that up with doing some homework in as well. In a time where it wasn't the norm, I think we're a lot more focused and, and you know, there's a lot more flexibility available, but you know, at that time it was, it was less normal. So in, in 2010, when I found myself a single parent, there was a further opportunity for me to get promoted in 2012, but this time I really did need to go full time. And, you know, being a single parent at that time, it, you know, the boys were eight and six. It was, it felt a little bit early for me, but I knew that I wouldn't get another opportunity or I was, I was unlikely to get another opportunity. You know, it would be limited. So I thought, well, I have to take this and, and make it work for us as a family. So I've now been in this role for 10 years. And as a middle, middle manager, you know, I have a level of response, responsibility where I, you know, I've been able to sustain being a single parent, but it, it hasn't been without its challenge. You know, things like sickness when the boys have been poorly, you have to prioritise them and I've either had to take leave at short notice or, you know, work from home, you know, you know, as I've already mentioned, in, a, in an environment that wasn't so, so flexible as it is, you know, these days. Um, I live in a, a, an area that local to me where there's um, a lot of young families and competition for school places is very high when we were looking for primary schools. Um, my youngest son, when I found myself being uh, single, was still at nursery school and I had to change my childcare arrangements in 2010. Um, and because of, you know, the competition with childcare, he, he did go to school nursery and I, I needed to keep that school nursery place for him. But what it meant was he needed picking up at 11.30 on a morning. So I found a fairly newly established day nursery that was able to do this pickup for me. So I thought, great, you know, everything's in place put it in uh, organised and on Michael's very first day going to this new day nursery, I got a call from school around 11.45 to say Michael hadn't been collected. So I dashed from work, picked him up, took him home, gave him some lunch, called the nursery and they were absolutely mortified that they'd forgotten to collect him. 
Um, but, you know, I still had to go back to work. So I took him to the day nursery and they were, you know, so apologetic and everything. But, you know, it needed to be done. And I know that these mistakes can happen in two parent families. You know, but when you're a one parent family, I very much felt that it was my responsibility. And, you know, I had limited support at that time because both of my parents were still working as well. So you, you very much relied on your your child care provision. But my sons do have a good relationship with their dad. They see him, you know, several times a week, and that's mostly been around their sort of sporting activities. They're both heavily involved in football and cricket. They're absolutely football and cricket mad. Um, and it was always good that he would be involved, you know, particularly on a weekend when we had clashes with games. He would take one and I would take the other. So, you know, that was really good. And, and they've got a great relationship with him. But my role was very much about the motivating around homework and going to school. And, you know, I always saw that as being my responsibility. I suppose in terms of my career, I'm, I'm in the same role that I've been in for, you know, 10 years, of, as I've already sort of explained, and I've needed to be fairly flexible um, just because of my circumstances. And this has probably caused, I, I'm going to describe it as career lag. Um, it has impacted on my career because obviously, you know, it's, it's still been um, had an impact, but I've managed my own development. You know, my role has evolved over the last 10 years. Um, with changes in, in legislation and funding provision and things, you know, I've managed that while still leading my team. I look for opportunities through, you know, CPD. I'm a STEM ambassador. Um, I, I'm heavily involved in the institution of the Chartered Institution of Housing and Transportation. I'm, I'm current vice chair of, of our regional committee. And I had a long standing ambition to be a chartered engineer, which I achieved in 2018. So, you know, I've managed to still keep my whilst managing a role in I've still sort of had ambition and, and made sure that I continued with my development but you know I'm really looking forward to my next chapter as my role of bringing up children is well it's essentially you know it, it's coming to an end um both of my boys have exams this sun, summer one doing A levels the younger one doing GCSEs and we've been looking at universities my eldest son is going to be leaving home in the autumn or essentially leaving home and, and moving away so you know what would I say about things? Well, I think, you know, to summarise, at times it can feel really chaotic. And I think, you know, you've got competing priorities with work and children. We all have to manage that, whether you're a one parent or a two parent family. But please really enjoy it and embrace it as well, because it goes so fast. I mean, I look back and I can still remember the day I brought James home in his, in his car seat and plonked him on the sofa and thought, what do I do with you now? you know, as, as we all do as parents, and, and here he is, he's off to university this year. So, you know, embrace it and enjoy it because it just goes so fast before you know it, they're adults. So now I'll hand over to Christopher, who I'm sure will, you know, enlighten you with his story too. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to get the chance to, uh, to join this panel and hopefully I can contribute something uh, interesting. Um, I probably come at this from a slightly different uh, angle than others um, because obviously I'm coming from the father or the partner's perspective on things um, and because I work in a university rather than in industry so as general background I'm a professor in the department of engineering at Durham University um, I'm the department's director of education um, and so I'm involved in sort of teaching research and the management of the department so it's quite a mixed uh, mixed role I have um, I want really to just talk sort of talk about my experience of of parenting but also of shared parental leave in particular um, and, and how that might interact with work a little bit um, so I'm, I'm particularly aware that everyone's experiences will be very different so this is just my experience what I, what I had with it but hopefully some of it has um, has maybe some relevance to to everyone else um, the first thing to say is you know my overall experience of parental leave of parenting has, has been great you know it's a, it's a fantastic uh, few years we've had um, my wife and I were joined by our son Alfred in uh, late 2017, uh, so he's four and a half now. Um, I took uh, the initial two weeks of paternity leave, um, then returned to work for a short while, and then had um, almost six months of shared parental leave um, from when Alfred was about three months old, um, and then he went off into nursery. Um, and one thing we did is my partner and I had a, a month of overlap, a sort of handover, um, which was a really valuable thing to do you know both both for me trying to work out what I needed to do but also I think for um for Ellen in feeling a bit more comfortable with the idea of going back to work um, at that point um we think we gained a huge amount from from the shared leave um from our point of view it's been really good in sort of setting up a very equal partnership 
um, that's worked quite well for us. So, you know, we can we can share any of the parenting responsibilities. Um, Alfred never became uh, sort of reliant on one or other of us for um, you know, feeding or bath time, bedtime, anything like that. And so that was really valuable when um, Ellen returned to work because her job involves a lot of evening work, um, that type of thing. So I think it was quite comforting for both of us to know we were happy with happy with doing that. Um, but there were plenty of more more challenging things in there, some of which are quite stereotypical. Um, so, so, for example, I'm listed as the main contact um, for Alfred at nursery, but they will always call his mum first. Um, and, you know, otherwise they've been great at, at all sorts of things, representing gender roles and parenting roles and things, but they'll, they'll nearly always call her first, um, even though I'm on the list. Um, but from, from the father's perspective, I, I suspect there are a lot of overlaps um, with the sort of attitudes encountered by mothers, um, uh, women in, in the workplace and, and more broadly, um, but also some differences. I mean, perhaps, uh, for example, because of sort of broader social attitudes um, that still seem to have the, the view that the father has an easy life, perhaps, in, in some of this. Um, you know, one of the challenges that felt to be overlooked was things like bottle feeding, um, you know, being alone with, with your baby, trying to feed them with a bottle is not entirely dissimilar to the idea of trying to get started with breastfeeding when you when you start out you you're out in public there's lots of screaming um lots of looks from other people quite an impressive feeling of failure um that's that's there i think regardless of who you are um so i think there's there's some relevance there and for for as a father there's a sort of strange addition of people looking at you and wondering why on earth man is looking after a baby in the first place um you know how how odd i must be to be doing that um you know i was usually the only the only man at the baby groups or the the parenting groups maybe the occasional granddad um and people didn't really know how to talk to me about it almost as though you had to talk about what was happening about parenting differently somehow with with a dad um when the, yeah there is a lot of overlap with these things and that extended into work you know the way people talk to you about things was very I know, it seemed very, very strange the way people did it. You know, people make unintentional comments. They're not meaning anything, but they'll say, oh, so uh, Ellen's gone back to work early, has she? As though there's some like, universally accepted um, you know, duration of parental leave and, and that I was sort of unreasonably intruding on this. And, you know, we'll only contact you if it's urgent. I can't imagine what would happen if we turn around to one of my female colleagues and taking maternity leave and someone had said, you know, we'll only get in touch with you if it's urgent. Oh, I'm still on leave um, for, for parenting purposes. Um, and, and a real highlight um, from the point of view of shared parental leave is I, I would never let my husband take my leave, um, which is one of the one of the big problems with the sort of parental leave system as it stands. If I would like to take parental leave, um, it the system implies I'm taking that I'm taking it away from the mother. Um, now, in our case, of course, the reality is that we agreed to share it. You know, this was a, a discussion we had and we worked out what we were happy with. Um, but that's how the system currently currently works. And indeed, we we've. Uh, we've now got our six week old second child um, and my uh, wife feels quite reasonably that she needs longer um, before she returns this time. So the system as it stands mean I have no choice about taking less leave this time around um, because you have to take it from the mother. Um, so that, that ties in with the, you know, how it's perceived at work. You're taking things away and it's those little comments that just sort of make it seem like you're, you're perhaps doing something wrong there. So um, to, to finish off, I'd say, you know, as always, I end up spending more time talking about the negatives than the, the huge positives of all of these things. It's really worthwhile. It's really positive. Um, and we are doing it again right, right now with our, our six week old and I'll be having time off in two blocks this time. Um, but hopefully that gives a few sort of points for thought or discussion from from the point of view of shared leave um, and, and the father, I'll leave it there and um, pass over to uh, Devila. Thank you. Hello, and uh, great to be with you here today. I'll start by admitting that my youngest is 27. So I'm looking back at this and actually it's been a joy to look back over the rearing of three children and trying to manage work and things. So my reflections come from a little bit of a distance and therefore maybe they're a bit glowing. Um, but I describe myself as civil engineer, wife and mother. And these three things do not always sit comfortably or neatly together. I think that's one of the first things we should recognise, you know, is that it's, it's not always easy and there are tensions and there are uncomfortable moments, but there's equally lots of joyous moments. I have I chose to work full time. And for the first, I took five months maternity leave, the second six months, and the third one, seven months. So this was all before the 12 month time. 
and there was no shared leave or anything like that. So definitely my position was I was taking maternity leave. I was looking after the children. My husband was working and I was always the first on call and remained so for many, many years. I chose that to go back to work in full time because I found myself in London six months after I arrived in London. Our first was born and I had no family here, no friends here. So actually, the easiest thing for me to do was to be at work where I had some semblance of some sort of support. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that I would recommend that now, but that was my circumstances at the time. So when I reflect back, I think about three different stages. First of all, I'd say the early days or early years. Then I would say the juggling years. And then I'd say where work takes begins to take a priority. So reflecting on the early years, you know, the challenge, my first challenge was how do you organize childcare? And I think this is very, very hard for new parents, particularly with their first child. How do I find somebody? How do I trust somebody? And for me, I was in a new city. Um, but we did find somebody and they lasted for five and a half years looking after our first daughter. Then um, the second thing I thought was difficult was regaining confidence. And I would say to anyone is just go back in and be confident because quite often that lack of confidence is in your own head. And the arguments I made to Arab was, um, I'm learning lots of things about managing um, little human beings who don't have a language are unreasonable. And if I can manage two or three unreasonable little beings at home, I can certainly manage some um, more reasonable men and women in the office. And I found I used a lot of those home skills in managing time. I also went out and joined some local neighborhood committees because it gave me a night out and away from the kids. But also I learned about agendas. I learned about committee work. I learned about making things happen at my local arms houses here in Fulham. And then I think but I, I, was something said earlier about bosses and leadership. When I went in to tell my first boss that I had literally started a job in London and I was expecting, his reaction, the wonderful Tony Stevens reaction was, that is marvelous news. What can I do to help you? So I think we should always just think about what is our first reaction when somebody gives us news like that, whether it's about adoption, IVF, anything, is to be really positive and supportive. And he remained positive and supportive. So there's something about, you know, the tone was set right for me. I try to set the, the tone for others. But those early days are really hard and setting your own boundaries. I had to leave at five o'clock to collect my daughter from the child minder at six. And I had colleagues who twinged, twinged about my early leaving or I wasn't doing enough work. So again, I went back to my boss, Tony, and said, Tony, what will I do? And he said, do you do your hours? I said, I do my hours plus. And he said, ignore them absolutely ignore them and carry on. So I want to say in those early days with the challenges, I had a lot of good support. I think the next stage, the juggling years, I had three children, London problem, three children in three different schools in three different directions. And so that wasn't easy. And also the children's expectations was around me being at the school gate. Mummy, why aren't you like the others? And that was very, very hard at the time but I would say ultimately worthwhile. And when I say to my kids who whinged at that time, what do you think now kids? And they say, oh mom, we're so glad you're a working mom. We're so glad that, and we now understand. So they don't hold it against me, but I would say it's really important to try and not miss any school events, sport days, prize givings, assemblies, whatever you can attend, excuse me, ditch work, because there's one time you can go to that school event. There's any amount of weekends or after hours when you can catch up on that work activity. So always catch those key moments. And I had another boss later on, John Thornton, who when he realized, you know, I was going to Ireland on holidays, he said, take longer, you know, don't just go for two weeks, take three weeks or four weeks. So I always managed to try and create a spell in the summer where I was really with the children and doing fun things and remembering that. So that, that, that was really important. And then there was always the panic in September when you had to get them back to school and uniforms and books and all that. And it was so stressful. But I, I now look back and say, do not worry if things are not perfect. You know, if you send them with the wrong swimming togs or they forget their towel, it gets sorted out. But I fretted dreadfully over those things at the time. Anyway. 
important, not important. And then more, then there comes a time in, well, there came a time in my career where the work responsibilities became much more serious and where I definitely, I would say, had to lean into work rather than leaning into the family. And I was hugely lucky too. The children were a little bit bigger and I had a very supportive husband. So the first one of those times came when I was um, asked to go to T5 at Heathrow, which meant me going, traveling in a different direction, hours less earlier and later, longer hours. Um, but again, my, the boss at the time said, what can you do that makes it weave in with your family? And what we did eventually then was that I did one of the school runs on my way to work. And so I dropped my middle daughter at school and then went to work. So I just taught my boundaries. I taught everyone at T5, I will not be there till, because I do the school run every morning. So I got family time and pe I'd, people understood that. It did mean I often stayed later in the evening. And the kids then were, you know, six and the younger ones were six and eight. The other one was a young teenager. So that was hard, but I think they, they understood that. There was times that were more difficult slightly, but again, thanks to my husband, um, I chose to work on T2 in Dublin. So I was away from home probably two nights a week. And the way I made that work was that I always away was on a Wednesday night. So the kids knew, husband knew, everyone knew. Wednesday night, dad is making dinner, kids are on their own. And it, it just became a thing. Mum is away on Wednesday night and it became normalized within the family. And then I had to find a different way of working when I was working in Abu Dhabi because it was one week in London, one week in Abu Dhabi, leaving on a Saturday often to be working on a Sunday in Abu Dhabi. Again, once the family knew the routine and they knew the expectations, that made it so much easier for me and I was able to do my work. So, you know, it's always about finding the right rhythm, but the rhythm has to work for your family as well as, as for work. And during all that, when, the, when you're being pulled in those two directions, um, it's very hard to find time for yourself. And it's taken me quite a long time to carve out moments for myself. So in Abu Dhabi, sometimes after work, I'd go to the swimming pool and swim under the stars and say, I have had 15 minutes, 20 minutes to myself before a business dinner uh, or something. So, you know, it makes us, you need that time. So give yourself those you know, that little bit of time. Um, I, th I think I've heard here a little bit, the children are growing up and you do move on to the next stage of your career, but they will always need you. And they need you in a different capacity. You know, they need you to deal with friendships at school, to deal with transitions, junior to senior, senior to university, GCSE choices, university visits, lots of life challenges. So, you know, you also, I feel the responsibility doesn't diminish. It's actually more serious issues that you often have to deal with. I found it helped to be involved in their school, to make connections with other parents. That definitely helped at, at that stage. And I'm not sure how you stay in contact once they go to university. It is much, much harder. But I would also say make them come home. Go and visit them. I've had some wonderful nights in Leeds, I have to tell you, <laughs> with my little daughter. We've enjoyed the cities where our children have studied. So I think go to them and see that they're okay. And finally, something for yourself. You know, somebody asked me a few years ago, how do you manage? I said, compartmentalize. I didn't know that word. I just said, you know, you just deal with that, deal with that, you know compartmentalize because you can't always be thinking about work when you're at home and think about home when you're at work. So you have to kind of close those doors. Use, find, and I was great to hear about being involved in, um, who was at earlier committees and things like that. I think you learn a lot outside work. And even as when you're at a stage in your career where you feel you're kind of in the doldrums, I've been there, where you feel you're not progressing, joining a committee and learning other skills, getting known in the industry is hugely valuable in the long term. So I would do I would do some of that. Um, and then I think there's a very long career post baby. So I would say my career was quite good before children, during children a bit flat. Um, but you know, my youngest, as I said, is now 27. 
So I've had a lot of years post parent, well, post the early days of parenthood. And that's probably when my career has developed the most. And I was speaking to a colleague in Australia this morning and she reminded me that 15 years ago, I said to her, there's never a good time to have a child, so get on with it. And she now has three children and she is chair of the Australasia region. She's co-chair of the Australasia region. So she said, Dervla, that advice was the best advice because she was putting off parenthood to get on with her career. And it has not impacted her career in the longer term. Has there been a parenthood penalty? Perhaps. Um, yes, there were difficulties. And yes, I can look back with rose tinted glasses now. Um, but I, I, I think to myself, it's a choice. I, I made the choice to have children. I made the choice to work. And, you know, I am living with that choice, consciously living with that choice. And I'm glad that I have done both those things. I think it's much better today because of shared responsibilities. I think uh, lots of dads like Christopher um, and uh, lots of same-sex couples managed to get a much better balance today than perhaps I had early on. So it's not a straight path. There's lots of ups and downs, but enjoy it as best you can. So thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to some questions. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for that really interesting and very diverse take on on parenting from all of you that was yeah lots of interesting things and lots of really good questions coming in there myself as a parent of a five-year-old and a two-year-old lots of um, good tips in there as well so thank you and I'm sure we'll get more in the next half an hour um, the first one I'm going to pick up on somebody mentioned a specific question to Rachel about policies within SRM but in general have any of you got examples of, sort of best practice in policies within your workplace to help with with parenthood I'll start with Rachel, seeing as someone's asked specifically, as obviously you're in the, the role that can help change those policies. Is there anything you've brought out or SRM do that's particularly different? Um, yeah, we, we've overhauled our approach to family leave um, over the past couple of years, um, reflecting on some of the challenges that we'd heard um, from uh, our employees and just from doing wider research. Um, and we've really... Um, sort of change the traditional nature of maternity and paternity leave and um, to try and break down some of those barriers and certainly um, reflecting on some of the things that Christopher said I think that's where we were trying to get to with it so at SRM um, everybody's treated the same so whether you're male female um, whether you um, have baby via birth adoption or surrogacy everybody's entitled to the same amount of leave um, paid leave off and um, so you know you don't have to have that sharing of leave or taking of somebody else's leave. It's your leave to take. Um, you can take it at the same time as your partner, for example, if you wanted to. But that is quite a, um, a new approach. There's not many companies that are doing that yet. But I would really like to think that's where we'll get to as a, as a country um, to really um, break down those gender stereotypes even further and create that equality of parenthood to help, to help everybody. Oh, that's good. That's really good to hear that companies doing that because, yeah, I don't know, Christopher was drawing on the fact that yeah, you've got to take away from the, the mother's leave to, to take your own. And I, I personally know a few a few dads who have done that, which is which is great. But yeah, you're, you're taking away from one to give to another. And I know different different countries do that very differently to how we do here. Um, Christopher, um, did you want to comment on that? Is there anything? Um, I, I would say I would say we are a bit behind, quite a long way behind on on some of these things. So, and it, it's very varied at Durham, um, depending on the type of role you're in. So, um, a lot of the prof, sort of professional support roles, um, you know, departments and line managers will do a really good job of making sure there's cover in place, for example, so that you're you're not getting these things about you. Know, will you'll get contacted while you're on leave or or anything like that. On the academic side, it is much much worse. Academia is still operating largely in the 1800s. You know, we, we, for me, my teaching was all crammed into one term because there's no cover for it. They don't get cover for academic staff when when you go on leave. So, um, much as I would like to say there were lots of good bits, good bits of practice, we're not we're not there yet. What has worked well though is things like certain line managers having different approaches. So, um, you know, as a as a father, I only get uh, I get one week of paid full paid leave, and then the next week is statutory pay at Durham. We don't get the full two weeks of pay or half pay or anything like that. Um, and generally 
the head of department here will try and bend the rules so that we can take holiday, for example, during term time, if that's a more appropriate way. We're not normally allowed as academic to take large chunks of holiday during term time. So he will try and support us where he can within the policies. And I think that's that is a positive thing because it gives examples of what could happen elsewhere. And maybe we can push changes in, in the sort of official policy that way. I guess the same question then to Joe in the public sector. <laughs> Um, I guess possibly more difficult to have those kind of changes of policy, but anything you've seen? I suppose, you know, from my perspective, a bit like Dervla, I was only, I only took six months maternity leave from both of my cases, you know, it's, it's some years ago now, so it was that kind of, you know, needing to bring the breastfeed into an end because I wanted to, you know, I was, I was going back to work, so I needed to sort of deal with that. Um, and now it's obviously much more flexible. So that I think is, you know, and it, the direction of travel is, is just, it's one way. We're certainly not going backwards in the public sector. And I think it's, you know, it's to be embraced that, you know, the, the changes are certainly happening. Zervala, anything to add? I have to say, I'm, I'm laughing. My middle one would not be weaned. And so for about 18 months, even though I was back at work, she was standing or sitting at the front door awaiting a feed every evening when I came home. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, and that work does not take into account. But anyway, so I got, brought back a memory. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think um, keeping in touch with people is becoming pretty standard practice, but it can be very lonesome when you're off maternity leave. So reaching out as a business, you know, your people department, HR department, but also as individuals, keeping in touch with them, inviting them in, sending them things, because otherwise it's 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 quite hard to come back. Um, I think giving people the flexibility to come back two days, three days, four days, one day. And we, we found quite a few people just keep in touch and do one day a week. And it, it's not very maybe interesting work, but they're keeping in touch with the business. So giving people the flexibility to come back as a way that works for them and over their careers flex up and down to suit the demands of work and suit their family demands. Uh, I should put in, it's not only these days caring for children, parenthood, you know, you're also finding, we're finding ourselves caring for our parents mm -hmm. at the same time. So it can be doubly hard. And I think that's important. But I, one of the things we've introduced, and that's quite a few years ago now, is the later stages that we promote women in line with the pool. So at, people who are at a particular grade, let's just say grade six, when we make our promotions to grade seven, which is associate, the percentage of women in that grade six pool will have that number of promotions at grade seven. So it means that women are being looked at, are being considered, and we're making sure they do not fall behind because they've been off or they're taking leave. It's on the merit of their performance now. And that's sort of promoting in line with the pool holds the bosses um, to account for maintaining people's careers and for making sure that we have a good female population. So that's not to do with the leave, but it's to do with helping women in their careers. No, that's good. Um, so one, an another question sort of to Christopher, um, but I, so I can sort of phrase it for everybody. In terms of when you first go and, go and tell your line manager, oh yes, expecting a child, can I take some shared parental leave please? I know that that question is going to be slightly different from a, a dad's perspective when it's a lot less common to go and take that shared parental leave. Um, how was that taken? How and the sounds of it, your your wife works at the university as well, which may have made things a bit easier. But um, how how you know how did that conversation go, and how did that how was that taken? Um, I I think because my line manager is very good, head of department, he he was he was good about that conversation as well. He was happy with the idea, but you know the one of the first things that came up was around you know what will we do to cover what you're doing um and and me sort of suggesting how the cover might be provided for that and moving my teaching around and uh that side of things so so that it, it was positive as a conversation but it was interesting that i i was the one who had to perhaps come up with the suggestions of how it would how it be dealt with and how it be solved um you you're quite right my, my partner works at the university as well um not in an academic department in one of our colleges um and that probably simplified the process, but it was interesting when we went from the head of department to HR um, to talk about what we needed to do because because they don't really know, you know. It's it, it, we were in a and I mean an engineering department where you know we're still massive percentage male academic staff um, in here, so you you would expect there to be several people perhaps who had done this. I think I'm one of two members of staff 
um, who've taken shared leave. Um, and and it, it did come down to really, well, what, what would you like to do? Well, we, we don't know what we can do. Yeah, well, here are some forms, go and fill them in. And it was sort of left to you to work out what to what to do. Um, and so I think when when it all came through, you know, it took a while for my line manager to sort of understand the idea that I would be off for a bit there and maybe coming back or that you were allowed patterns of leave within that. I think that could have caused complete panic if I'd said I'm here for one week off for another. That would have been, been chaos there. So it was a good conversation, but it was a conversation where nobody in the room knew what to do really and knew how to respond to it particularly um and that that would be that would be something i would like to see change but it needs to start with hr understanding what's going on and then training other people who are involved in line management to to understand it i guess i guess from the hr point of view rachel and i know from I've got a colleague um at my previous company had the same thing as christopher there like he was the first person to ask for shared parental leave is there anything you know from an hr point of view to try and yeah educate parents i guess and you know so suddenly you realize you're going to become a parent. What are my options? Yeah. <laughs> what can I do? I know it's not that. Yeah, it's quite complicated. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, I mean, and for anybody that's read the shared parental leave guidance, it is not straightforward. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, uh, trying to explain that to somebody, talk them through the steps and all the various documentation and backwards and forwards, especially if you've got uh, parents that work for different organisations. Um, it's not set up to make it easy. Um, you know, we've, tr we've tried to simplify the guidance in our own policy, but even then it's, um, it's not straightforward. So I think from, from our perspective, we always try to um, have a chat with somebody, talk them through the options, try and simplify it in sort of a one page schedule um, just to try and get a record. So everybody understands where they stand, what they're entitled to, what's going to happen when, and have regular check-ins with people to see how they're getting on um, at the various milestones. So it's just about those open lines of communication, um, but it, it isn't a straightforward process to go through. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's just about keeping in touch with people and explaining things in the best way possible yeah. when there's lots of different things going on all at one time. Um, so we've got a question that um, can go to all of you. Um, someone listening has got a team member who's had seven years out of work raising a family. Have you, any of you, can you give your tips on how that person can be supported on finding their way back into the world of work? I'll go to Joe first. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. I mean, it's about having the, you know, the conversations, isn't it? And welcoming them, making them feel that, you know, that, that they're, that they've got a positive contribution to give to the team and the workplace. And it's about, you know, embracing them and making sure that their workload is, is right and, and managing that, that transition back into the workplace, I think. I think it's just showing kindness, being nice to people, you know, that's really important. Being, you know, the human touch and, and just from a, a management perspective, it's just, having those kind of personal you know the repertoire and the, the conversations and just yeah being nice to people I think is and encouraging that you know making sure that you they're not feeling stressed or under pressure and just being supportive generally. I'll go to Dervila. Seven years is indeed a very long time to be away from the workplace but I would go back to what I said earlier, they will have changed as an individual, perhaps developed and learnt new skills. And the organisation will also have changed. They'll have been on two separate paths for seven years. And so I think it's about bringing them, bringing people back together, helping them understand where the organisation's gone, helping the organisation understand where they're at and that they've um, expectations of one another can be met in a very positive, I think kind was a really good word there, in a kind way, and really setting you know, ambitions or expectations that are really achievable and you can build confidence again, because the individual will have lost their confidence in that workplace environment, but there's no doubt that they can get back to it. So you just provide the support and work with them to make it a success. Yeah. Christopher? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can add much more to that. I would say even people who've been out, out for shorter periods of time, probably just being clear with them what what the rules are of engaging with this you know what are people expected to do what can they contribute they may well have very interesting different experiences they can bring into a team um and and that their experience could well be very useful for somebody else who's thinking about taking a break from something as well you know they could they could be quite positive things that, that person can contribute i would like to think thank you finally rachel I agree with with everything that that's been said. I think it's about having that honest conversation um, about maybe understanding the 
any sort of reservations that the person may have any insecurities they may have um, and being able to try and support them with those you know there might be certain skills that they think that they need a bit of more help with so it's just about trying to get to the honest truth I think and and working out in a really supportive way how you can um, boost their confidence you know help them as much as you can yeah I hope that's helped give some ideas um, I've got a question for you all of you. Uh, myself and my husband both work part time. We both work about 30 hours a week, having had our two children. Um, I know various of you have touched on sort of working part time. Um, we've both been lucky enough to get to move roles and remain part time. And I know a lot of people aren't that lucky. Um, I guess a question for Rachel, how is that looked at and supported within within SRM in terms of, you know, are there advertising roles as part time, but obviously might be, might be more appealing to parents. Um, but just trying to fit that part time or anyone's experiences and how that how you've managed to get that to work. Uh, yeah, we do um, have a number of part time employees. Um, I would say still predominantly women, um, which is something that hopefully will change over time. We do have more and more um, mainly dads, but also um, men who are, say, working towards retirement age, for example, putting in part time working requests. So we've definitely seen an uptake in that. Um, the culture at SRM is to always try and make it work, um, you know, I, so that we start from a place of trying to find a solution, which I think is a great mindset to start with. Um, you know, so it's something that we're doing more of. Um, I think that having the open and honest conversations at an early stage to try and work out how things can work is really useful especially if it's something like coming back from maternity or paternity or something that you know is some, is going to happen at some point in the future to start having those conversations early on is really helpful um, and to set out as an individual if you are struggling to get agreement try and set out you know how how you think it's going to work in practice ask for a trial period so that you can demonstrate it's going to work um, and, and really coming at it with a positive attitude. The same question to Joe. I know you mentioned that you did work part time for various of those years. Um, do you think that had an impact on your career progression? Um, I, I think it perhaps did. I think what I found, again, a little frustrating, really, because I was I was we were very much um, in the minority in terms of women in the engineering um, business in in the local authority that I was working for at the time, and I think um, when I came when I came back from my first maternity leave and I came back part time, the only option available to me was job share. You need to go job share, and being an engineer, getting another job share was incredibly difficult, and it was something that the other half of my role was never filled. So we there was a consultant used to come in a couple of days a week to kind of fill in that additional workload if you like but um when I went then I went on maternity leave the second time and then came back again doing 18 hours but then I, I did have the opportunity to get a promotion and move up to being a principal engineer but again at that time my line manager wanted me to go full time so I negotiated my hours and said oh, I can do 30 hours but you know I want it to be working in this way and so well, we'll give it a trial so I was a bit certainly in our organization I was a bit groundbreaking there wasn't anybody else had done anything like that I, I sort of pushed it from you know I, I want this to work for my family um, and I, you know I was looking at oh. you know but I had to make sure that I made it work I had to put a lot of focus and, and effort into making it work as well because I'd asked for it I had to demonstrate that you know it yeah. worked so that was certainly you know my experience of it and now it's much more flexible and there's you know there's a lot more women are coming into the more technical roles uh, some certainly going and reducing hours and things like that, but not from, uh, there's certainly no men in our organisation who've reduced hours um, around parental responsibility at all. That's not something that's kind of filtered through yet, but hopefully, you know, in the future that will that will certainly come. So the, the same question to you, Derbala, by the sounds of it, you, you never went back part-time, you went back full-time, that's what I understood. Um, did you ever consider it? I, I did consider it, but, the fact was once I'd organized childcare for three children, well, even with one, I either had to pay the full cost of the nursery or the childminder, regardless of how many hours they turned up. Right. The same when I had two, and then when I had three. So it sort of became easier to just say, childcare is that, and then um, this is the time that I'm at work. 
Um, but I think, and we have quite a lot of men also, it's a growing number of men working part-time and it can't, quite a lot of it is for, to look after kids, to do the shared responsibilities. Um, but also just people just taking a little bit less time at work to do other things in their life. It might be community work or some volunteering or something like that. So I think it is increasing. So I think we should think a little bit more about flexible working. And I know some people don't want to give up their full-time pay for reduced hours. So we certainly allow people to work their hours over a full week. So if it suits a couple or somebody to work on Sundays and take a day off during the week to do childcare, you know, that's totally acceptable. Flexing one's hours is totally flexible. People say, I work from eight till four or three, or I work from seven till. So total flexibility in terms of how you work your hours, I think allows people to remain as engaged in the business or as productive as they want to be. So I think choice, giving choice is probably the key and being flexible as an employer. So that would be my experience. And I'd love if in our sector there was more job shares. Um, I talked earlier about um, my colleague in Australia, the two ladies there, Kate and Karen, they applied jointly for the role of chair of the region and they wouldn't accept it singly. They <laughs> both have young families. And so we are experimenting with something brand new is to uh, two mothers in charge of one of our regions. And it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic to demonstrate that um, co-leading, co-chairing, sharing a job with works really well. And I think one of the keys to it is being really clear about who you go to for a particular thing, who's how are the responsibilities shared? So personally, I really want to do a job share when I was younger. And I couldn't find anyone and I couldn't find that as a norm because that would have been my perfect solution. Yeah. And finally to you, Christopher. Um, yeah, I think uh, just to tie it specifically in with the sort of penalties side of things, I think one of, one of the key things when we've, we haven't got many staff who work part time, but certainly when I've looked at it and when I've seen other people looking at part time working is, is the sort of honest conversation about the, the needs of the individual and the, the needs of the organisation and how how you can sort of correctly balance the responsibilities within that because you know, um, I imagine similar things happen in industry but in academia you know in order to progress through the organization you need to show the capabilities in lots of different areas you know if you're going part-time and that wipes a whole area out of your CV um, you, it's effectively torpedoing your chances of progression um, and promotion in organizations so I think it's very important as that that sort of discussion there that we're not cutting off key key elements of somebody's um somebody's role so that they can keep making progress in the organization as as is appropriate for them for me i haven't taken part time i keep keep looking at it um but alongside the need to keep the responsibilities in different areas i just worry that i'm never going to actually be relieved of that percentage of workload and I think that's a big thing for people looking at it is, are you actually going to, you know, if you take that four days a week, you have 20% change in your pay and, and that time spent at home uh, or doing whatever it is you're going to be doing, are you going to see that 20% actually disappear from your workload or are you just going to end up working full time um, for less money in a short period of time? And that, that's one of the big worries for me and why I've not, not yet taken it. I'm hoping we might make some progress. <laughs> I know we've had lots of questions in that. We've got one final one linked back to our title of the uh, of our of our event today. So, for all of you, just to round up, how much do you think this is, it's a parenthood penalty, or is it more a motherhood penalty? Um, and I'll start with Rachel on that one. Oh, good question. <laughs> um, I think it's a parenthood penalty, but um, I think that women suffer the most currently. Um, and I think that's because of these gender stereotypes, the roles that women are expected to play and the roles that men are expected to play, which I think we're making progress with. Um, but I think we've still got a long way to go. Um, and it's tied into much wider issues around things like gender pay gap and other and other issues that we're all aware of. But it's going to take some time for us to address. Um, but I think that, you know, things like this, just having these honest conversations and um the organizations that are able to lead by example and um and try and change things and, and make some really good progress so i'm i'm optimistic but i think we've got a long way to go thanks same to joe 
Yeah, similar to Rachel, really. I think it was a motherhood penalty, but now the direction of travel is its parenthood penalty. And I think if I was, you know, starting again now, you know, if I was 20 years younger and, and starting to think about having children now, I think it, it would be very different to the experience I had, you know, sort of 20 years ago, very much different. And I think the choices that you have now are much more flexible. There's, there's more availability for you. And, you know, again, for your partner, the, the, there's choices there which weren't available at the time it was pretty much at, you know you go part-time or no one goes part-time and I think you know the, the direction of travel is great and I think it's about making sure that us as managers you know and in our position of responsibility that we have those conversations with our team and that we get the best out of them that we, we provide them with the support that they need because ultimately they're the ones you know it's your people are your best asset and I think it's making sure that we give that focus and enjoy um, working with people and, and, and knowing that, you know, they've got this work-life balance that has to be managed. And, you know, behind the scenes, it's often that that chaos and, and you know, they're trying to portray the swan above the water when they're underneath the feet are, you know, paddling it away. So I think it's just making sure that we give that support and uh, certainly moving in the direction of a parenthood penalty. Thanks. Christopher, very interested to hear your take on it. Uh, I, I think at the moment it's it's motherhood. Um, but I think some of, some of that is because it's motherhood, it's going to extend to affect parents in general. Um, I think I think the, the, the biggest, the worst, the worst outcome that could happen for people, I think, is that equality is achieved by by just ensuring everybody is hit by some sort of penalty. Um, and what would be much better is to see that as more people take shared leave and uh, things hopefully become a little more balanced. Um, that the system improves not that we just try and get everybody to the same level so that would be uh, for me would be one of the best things we could see as an improvement there as Dervila says some of this stuff is our choice you know we refer you we do choose to do these things but there shouldn't be anything sy systemic that is then um uh, is then limiting people's abilities to progress and enjoy ideally what they're doing we're not always trying to progress sometimes we're just trying to enjoy our jobs and our lives thank you finally then to Dervila I would agree with everything that's said, so I won't repeat that, but I think it's really absolutely wonderful that conversations like this are held because I think I'm hoping that the audience listening or even us just sharing amongst ourselves here that we've learned something and we've enabled people to ask for that more flexible working and feel confident that they can work towards something that works for them and their family. So I'm hoping that these sort of conversations are very enabling. And then I want to say that, you know, perhaps there's a good outcome from COVID. You know, we've all demonstrated that we can work from home. We've demonstrated we can work more flexibly. And I think employers will just have to sit up and think, oh, actually, maybe we're moving into a new and different area. And hopefully that will enable individuals to find the right balance for employers to be much more flexible in their approach going forward. So I think it's an era of change and change for the good. Definitely. Let me hope so. But I'll hand back over to Beth then to finish off. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. That was that was especially from a personal perspective. That was very inspirational. Um, and there's some very lovely comments in, in the chat for the speakers if you want to go and have a look at them. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining today and for sharing your personal stories. Um, this has been recorded and it will be made available on the Engineering Together YouTube channel. Um, if you've signed up, you will get sent out as an email as well. Um, but please, you know, do share this video as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much again and, and hopefully see some of you at a future event.